Hi, welcome back to this my sixth data update for 2023. In this update, I want to focus on debt. Now, before I begin, let's face it, we have an uneasy relationship with debt as human beings, as investors, as businesses. On the one hand, we borrow money to run businesses, to buy houses. On the other hand, almost every religion on the face of the earth has moral overtones of, on debt. Now, if you borrow money, you're weak. If you lend money, you're a sinner. And that comes from a history of, I guess, human beings borrowing too much and getting into trouble. That said, though, in this post, I'm going to steer away from the moralistic components and talk about debt as a financial choice, and in particular, about corporate debt in 2022. Now, most years, you might say, what can happen to debt policy it doesn't change that much. But 2022 was an unusual year. As we'll see, interest rates went up significantly, and companies faced up to choices they made in a decade of low interest rates. With that long lead in, though, let's think about where debt fits in a business. To set debt in place, I want to use a structure that I've used in many places before, a financial balance sheet. In a financial balance sheet, I look at what a company's business is and break it down into assets in place, investments it's already made, and growth assets, the value that I attach to investments I expect it to make in the future. And on the other side of the ledger, I look at the two ways you can raise money to run a business. One is from debt, borrowed money, the other is your own money, equity. Now, debt and equity supply capital to a business. The only real difference is in the kinds of claims they have against a business. With debt, you get a contractual claim to get paid interest and principal payments. You don't take much of a role in how the company is run. Equity, you get a residual claim. You get whatever is left over, but you get a much greater say in how the business is run. So with that lead, and let's think about why the mix of debt and equity might matter to a business and why one mix might work for one company and another for not work for another. To understand the trade-off and debt, I'm going to present you with two trade-offs. One, one which I call real trade-off, the things that matter. And the second, what I'm going to call illusory trade-offs that often drive debt decisions. So let's start with the real trade-off, the things that should matter. If you think about the real trade-off and debt, the biggest single benefit of debt is endowed to us by the government. It's a tax benefit. If you take tax benefits away, much of the advantage of using debt disappears from business. That tax benefit, of course, takes the form of you have interest payments, they're tax deductible, but cash flows to equity have to come out of after-tax cash flows. There is a secondary benefit to debt, which is in some companies where managers own very little equity in the company and are sloppy and lazy, Sometimes you can make them more disciplined by forcing them to borrow more money. You're saying, how? Well, if they take bad projects, then there's a chance the company might not be able to make its contractual payments. It could go bankrupt and they could lose their jobs. You've got to make this personal. That's on the plus side of that. On the minus side of that, the biggest worry you have when you borrow money is not only does borrowing money make your equity earnings more volatile, because remember, you've got to make those interest payments in good times and bad times, but it creates truncation risk. What's truncation risk? The risk that your company might not survive. It creates failure risk. That expected bankruptcy risk is a huge factor when you think about borrowing. And the greater that risk, the less you should borrow. Again, there's a secondary cost. When you invite borrowing into a firm, you're inviting a claim holder with a very different set of incentives than you do. Let me be specific. Equity investors like upside. Lenders hate downside. So what's good for equity investors and what's good for lenders can often clash. You're saying, who cares? It shows up as costs. It shows up as covenants, restrictions on you as an equity investor when you borrow. And you've got to factor that in when you borrow. So the real trade-off is tax benefits and this disciplinary benefit versus bankruptcy costs and what I'm going to generically call agency costs, the different interests of lenders and stockholders. In theory, this is what should drive the debt, debt and equity choice. But in practice, there are a lot of illusory benefits and costs that come into play. Let's take the most common one. Debt is cheaper than equity. And on the face of it, that's absolutely true. If you look at a, at a business raising equity from equity investors who demand a rate of return based on the risk in a business and you borrow money, debt is almost always going to be cheaper than equity. But that's only on the face of it. As we'll see in a few minutes, when you borrow money at a low rate, even though the rate is lower than, than what you would have to pay on equity investors, you push up both the cost of equity and the cost of debt. So it's an illusion. In fact, if you did not have a tax benefit, 
borrowing money at a lower rate than equity would raise both costs enough that you end up with the same cost of capital, even though you have more debt. The second benefit, and sometimes I run into this, especially with real estate developers or private equity investors, is they argue that using more debt will increase your expected return equity. Absolutely, it will. But is that good? Doesn't it have to be compared against the cost of equity? And that cost of equity will be pushed up by the same forces that push up your return equity. So if you're borrowing money simply because you think it's cheap and that you're not counting the tax benefit, just look at the rate you're paying on the debt, or because you want to push up your return equity, you're probably borrowing for an illusion. On the other side, there are people who refuse to borrow money for illusory reasons as well. I've heard one, one CFO that I talked to said, if you borrow money, you'll have lower net income. Of course you will. You have interest expenses to pay. But remember, you also have much less equity at play. So even though your net income is lower, your earnings per share might actually be higher. I've also had companies say that if you borrow money, they will become riskier. Their ratings will drop. That too is true. But so what? Would you rather be a AAA rated company that never borrows money or a single A rated company that actually borrows money? These illusory benefits are reasons sometimes companies have for not borrowing or borrowing money. It's tough to make them let go because they hang in there. So with that long lead in, let's think about practical ways of coming up with the right debt mix for your company. To make this, 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 uh, to make this optimization work, I'm going to draw on a tool you've seen before, especially in the last post. Remember in the context of investment analysis, we talked about the cost of capital as a hurdle rate, a rate you need to beat to be able to take an investment? Well, the cost of capital is a Swiss army knife in finance. It's the optimizing tool that I use to decide on the right debt mix. You're saying, how is a cost of capital going to allow you to come up with the right debt mix? Now, there are two components in the cost of capital. There's a cost of equity and a cost of debt. As I borrow money, both those numbers will change. The cost of debt will change because I'll become a riskier company as I borrow more money. Lenders will demand higher interest rates. The cost of equity will go up because as I borrow money, I'm making my equity earnings more volatile. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to change the debt ratio, play out the effects on the cost of equity and the cost of debt, and even check the tax rate. Because remember, to get the tax benefits from debt, I need enough taxable income to cover interest expenses. This is a dynamic process. And as I change debt ratios, I might benefit early on from borrowing money. My cost of capital might decrease, but at some point in time, the trade-off will start to work against me. There will be a mix that minimizes my cost of capital. And in a simplistic way, that's your optimal mix of debt and equity. If so, if you think about what the drivers of this optimal debt ratio are, and you can try it out in different companies. In fact, I'll give you a link to a spreadsheet you can use to compute the optimal debt ratio for pretty much any company. The key driver is the marginal tax rate. Let me start with an assertion. If your marginal tax rate is 0%, your cost of capital can only go up when you borrow money. It can never go down. Think of the reason why. If I take away the tax benefit of debt, you still have bankruptcy costs right on the other side. There's no benefit to borrowing money. There's a significant cost. You shouldn't borrow money. Of course, you might choose to borrow money anyway, as people in the Middle East or companies in the Middle East often do. We'll talk about why that happens. But from a purely value perspective or cost of capital perspective, when your marginal tax rate is zero, you shouldn't borrow money. The higher your marginal tax rate, the more you should borrow. It's a heat map of marginal tax rates around the world. The red parts of the world have the highest marginal tax rates. So all else being equal, companies in those countries should borrow more, right? India, Brazil, Australia. But here's a catch. Brazil and Australia actually have a component of the tax code that also gives a tax advantage partially to equity. In Australia, investors and shares are allowed when they receive dividends to not pay tax if the company has already paid taxes on the income from which those dividends are paid, effectively giving a tax benefit to equity. Brazil has a component called interest on capital, where equity investors get a tax benefit. So Australia and Brazil, if you bring in those offsetting effects, debt might not have the advantage that it looks like it does. Over the world, though, if you look at especially the biggest economies, the marginal tax rates are converging between 25 and 30 percent. The U.S. used to be an outlier until 2017 at a 40% marginal tax rate. It's now closer to 25 to 27 percent. Much of Europe has settled in 25 percent. Eastern Europe, competing for capital, trying for companies, has lower tax rates. But 
those tax rates, in my view, as countries develop, are going to converge on a 25% because, you know, governments need tax revenues and um, you can't keep lowering your corporate tax rates to try to get more companies in if you can't collect enough tax revenues. So that's the first factor driving your optimal debt ratio. The higher the marginal tax rate, the higher the optimal debt ratio. The second is this approach is very much a cash flow driven approach to how much you can borrow. It's not driven by how much you have in assets or what your market value is. You need cash flows and earnings to service debt. And the more cash flows you generate as a company relative to your market value as a company, the more you can borrow, the higher your optimal debt ratio. One simplistic proxy is EBITDA, kind of a rough measure of operating cash flow as a percentage of enterprise value, which is the market value of the entire firm. The higher the EBITDA as a percentage of enterprise value, the higher your optimal debt ratio is going to be. The third factor, in addition to marginal tax rate and the cash flow level, is the, the risk in those cash flows. The greater the uncertainty, the greater the risk in your business, the less you will be able to borrow other things remaining equal. Pretty common sense propositions. So this approach can allow you to come up with the right mix for a company. And that right mix minimizes your cost of capital. Now you might say, so what does minimizing my cost of capital do? Remember the value of your business is the present value of your expected free cash flows which are pre-debt cash flows, discounted back at the cost of capital. If I hold all else constant and minimize my cost of capital, I'll maximize my value as a firm. There's one caveat, though, that I need to point out. Minimizing the cost of capital will maximize the value of your firm only if your pre-debt cash flows are unaffected by how much you borrow. You're saying they're pre-debt, they should be unaffected. But let's say you borrow so much that you create distress risk for yourself. You're in the news as a company that might default. You know what could happen? Customers might buy, stop buying your product. Suppliers might demand cash. Your employees might start leaving. It's a debt spiral you can get into. It's called an indirect bankruptcy cost. And if that starts to happen, you can no longer focus on minimizing your cost of capital. You've got to go back to maximizing value. But that's a mechanism, whether it's minimizing cost of capital or maximizing value that you can use to decide the right mix for you. Now, I want to try this on a company that I talked about recently, actually a group of companies. A few weeks ago, I talked about the Adani Group, this Indian family group that's been targeted by Hindenburg. And one reason Hindenburg targeted them was in addition to viewing them as committing fraud, Hindenburg said they had too much debt. At the time that I valued Adani, the Adani, Adani Enterprises, the, 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 the flagship company for the group, I admitted they probably had too much debt, but I really never checked. So I decided to go back and check to see whether the Adani group was over levered. I started with Adani Enterprises, which is the holding company. And here's what I did. I did what I just described. I changed the debt ratio. I computed the cost of capital and the firm value at every debt ratio. Remember, I'm trying to maximize value, minimize cost of capital. The optimal debt ratio for the Adani Enterprises, the percentage market value, is about 10%. That's about half, less than half of their existing debt. They're over levered by more than, you know, they, they've, they're, the amount of debt they have is more than twice what they should have. How does that hurt them? It raises their cost of capital, it lowers their firm value. And this, is, and this has nothing to do with fraud or any of the other issues Hindenburg brought up. Based on their operating earnings and cash flows, it looks like the Adani, Adani Enterprises is over levered. Of course, this is just one of seven publicly traded Adani companies. And I wondered whether there might be some cross-subsidization going on. What does that mean? Well, you have family group companies. Sometimes one company might borrow a lot. Another company doesn't borrow very much. Collectively, they're around the right amount of debt. So I wanted to check to see whether the Adani group had too much debt. So I took the seven companies. I aggregated everything, operating income, market cap, total debt, cash flows, and I looked at the optimal financing mix of the Adani Group, and I came to pretty much the same conclusion. The optimal debt ratio is around 10%. And collectively, the group has significant, almost three times as much debt as it should have, given its earnings and cash flows. Incidentally, if you look at both these charts, notice something. Debt doesn't even help them that much, even when their cost of capital is being lowered by borrowing money. It's barely dropping. This is a company where the benefits of debt are minor. You're saying, but they use it all the time? Lots of companies do. 
In fact, many companies choose to borrow more than their optimal and some borrow less. And you say, why? And I can give you four reasons why companies end up with financing mixes that are dysfunctional or not right for them. The first two are the two most common reasons for why companies do what they do in corporate finance. The first is inertia. This is what we've always done. We're not going to change. Telecom companies, why do you borrow money? Because that's what we've always done. Airlines, why do you borrow money on top of your aircraft leases? Because that's what we've always done. The second is me tooism. Why do you borrow money? Because everybody else in our sector borrows money. Why do you not borrow money? Because nobody else in our sector borrows money. It might strike you as strange that big, sophisticated corporations would do it. But it's actually the safest place to be for your management. Because if something goes wrong, you can always say, look, everybody else was doing it. The two other reasons, though, are potentially more dangerous. I've heard companies say they borrow money because lenders keep are willing to keep lending them money. You say, if lenders keep, are willing to keep lending me money, why would I stop? Because ultimately, if you default, it's you that's defaulting. I mean, the analogy I would offer is if you're on a diet and you walk into a restaurant that has a buffet lunch and you eat as much as you can and you gain 10 pounds, you can't say the buffet made me do it. It's still your fault. So just because lenders are willing to lend you money doesn't mean you shouldn't stop. And the fourth reason is the reason that I think the Adani Group and Adani Enterprises is too much debt. If you're a growing company, you need capital to grow. That capital can come from debt, which is borrowed money, or equity, which often requires either new shares or raising new equity. You know why companies that are fixated on control will never use the latter? Because if you issue shares, you're going to dilute your ownership. So you keep borrowing money well beyond the point you should have stopped. So when you look at a company's actual debt ratio, it can be very different from its optimal. It's worth asking the question, why? Does it make sense? Or should they be trying to move towards the optimal? So with that long lead-in, let's think about how to measure how much debt a company carries. One is to go back to a financial balance sheet, where we said there are two ways you can fund a business, debt and equity, and look at debt as a percentage of overall capital, debt plus equity. You think that's simple enough. Everybody should agree on that. Not necessarily, because there are variants in how you compute this debt to capital. You can use gross debt, which is total debt outstanding, or you can net cash out from it to come up with net debt. Much of the world, people, when they talk about debt ratios, are talking about net debt ratios. There's nothing inherently better about one over the other, but you better be talking about the same debt ratio if you're having a debate. The second is whether you use book value, the accounting values for debt and equity, or market values. In almost everything we do in finance, we use market values because ultimately when you raise equity or raise debt, you've got to do it at market values, but you can get very different numbers. So I computed gross and net book and market debt ratios for every publicly traded non-financial service firm. He's saying, what, what about financial service firms? Different beast altogether. Now, I don't even know whether debt is a source of capital to a bank. It's really raw material. For non-financial service firms, we look at the distribution of debt ratios, you're probably going to be surprised. Why? Because the story we've all been hearing for the last decade is companies are getting over levered, they're borrowing way too much, and that might be true for some companies, but the median debt to capital ratio in market value terms is about 10%. It's, um, you know, and, and same for book value. The median company doesn't have that much debt. But the larger companies do. In fact, the way this shows up is I actually computed aggregated debt ratios by region. I took all of the debt divided by all of the equity, and you get much higher ratios. But even there, if you look across regions, you notice differences. On a book debt ratio basis, the most levered part of the world is the U.S., with a debt ratio in gross debt terms that exceeds 50%, net debt terms about 46%. That's in book capital. In market value terms, the U.S. doesn't look that bad. In fact, it's got a lower debt ratio than the median for the world. Latin America looks like it's the most levered part of the world with a 38% gross debt ratio and a 33% market debt ratio. Again, the reason I do this is not to confuse, but to point out that when you're talking about debt ratios, you need to be specific about how you define debt, gross or net, whether using book value or market value. Incidentally, there are a dozen other sub-variants of this. Should I use long-term debt or total debt? Should I include lease debt? My advice is include all interest-bearing debt and lease debt when you talk about debt. Don't splice it and 
to short-term and long-term debt, don't play games. Get a measure of comprehensive debt that reflects how much your company owes in contractual obligations. So debt to capital measures the percentage of your overall capital that comes from debt, but it has a fatal flaw. You cannot make interest payments and principal repayments from capital. You can be the largest market cap company in the world, but you can't use that to pay off interest. You need earnings and cash flows. So to measure debt load from the perspective of can I service it, there are two ratios that I'm going to use. One is the interest coverage ratio. The interest coverage ratio is earnings before interest and taxes divided by interest expense. You think, what does that tell me? If you're a lender, you want that ratio to be as high as possible because that means you have a buffer. In case something goes wrong, there's still enough earnings to make your interest expenses. The higher the interest coverage ratio, the safer a company. The problem, though, is focuses only on interest expenses. You're saying, what about debt payments? To counter that, the second ratio takes the total debt outstanding in a company and divides it by EBITDA, which is a rough measure of cash flows from operations. On this measure, you want the lowest number you can if you want to save company. A company with a huge amount of total debt relative to EBITDA is riskier in terms of default risk than a company with a lower number. Interest coverage ratios and total debt to EBITDA. I'm not claiming these are the only two. There are other variants, but they're correlated with these two. I computed these again for every publicly traded company and computed the, the distribution. But rather than focus on the distribution, which is all over the place, I wanted to look at the differences across sectors. If you look at interest coverage ratios, the most levered sectors are utilities and real estate. No surprise there, right? The least levered sectors are materials and information te and technology. Same thing with total debt and EBITDA. You look at the variance, the sectors with the most debt are real estate and utilities, technology, and in this case, en energy is surprisingly low which suggests again that companies don't always borrow based on what they're making right, right now. They look at their earnings over a cycle. So clearly there are differences in how much of a debt load you see across sectors. But sectors are broad, lots of different industries within each. So here's what I did. I broke those sectors down into 94 industry groups and I looked for the most levered and the least levered industry groups using the debt to EBITDA as my key sorting variable, but it's correlated with the other measures as well. So let's look at the most levered groups. Lots of real estate related groups, right? Hotel and gaming, lots of real estate, real estate, REITs, real estate. Couple of energy, green and renewable energy and oil and gas distribution. I wanted to remember those two because when you look at the least levered, you're going to see oil and gas as among the least levered, mining among the least levered. Clearly, within the energy sector, it depends on what part of the sector you're in as to how much debt you take on. You also have a couple of legacy borrowers, auto and truck, air transport, because that's the way they've always run their business with a lot of debt. And of course, a couple of utilities, most levered. Among the least levered, you have a lot of technology companies. Now, part of that is because you have volatile earnings. Part of it is also, and this reflects in both, both groupings, is that bankers like to lend based on tangible assets. And as a consequence, real estate gets a leg up over, over software or technology. Industry groups are the most and the least debt. Which brings us to the final piece of this puzzle. So we've talked about debt loads, we've talked about an optimal mix. But hanging all, over all of this like a dark cloud with debt is the threat of default. If you look at why companies default, Mathematically, it's very simple, right? It's because you don't have the earnings to cover your interest expenses. But default itself is can run the spectrum. You can default on a loan and not default as a company, right? You can default on a loan and find a way to, to figure things out. So defaulting on your loan obligations um, is not necessarily defaulting as a company because defaulting as a company often is a legal process. You declare bankruptcy. You end up in the court system. And among the companies that go into bankruptcy, only a few actually get liquidated. Many that go into bankruptcy come back after restructuring as, as continuing operations. The reason I make, make these, these, the, uh, making this divide, so lots of reasons companies default. One is company specific. Something happens to the company. It, it could be because competition eats away their, their, their earnings. It could be um, 
it could be a sudden cost that they face, it could be a shock to the system like a lawsuit that they lose, a strike. So it could be company specific, it can be sector wide. Now remember disruption was a word that venture capitalists loved for the last decade. Well, a lot of disruptors became multi-billion dollar businesses, but there's a dark side of disruption. For every Uber that succeeds, there are 100 taxi cab companies that default. Entire sectors melt down. So when you have a disrupted sector, you find your revenue shrinking, your margins under pressure. The brick and mortar world, Bed Bath & Beyond right now, reflection of, I mean, if you think about it, it's not that the debt in Bed Bath & Beyond has doubled or quadrupled over the last decade. It's that the operating income has collapsed at these companies sector-wide. It can be macro-driven. Now, macro-driven in what sense? If you're a commodity company, an oil company, a sudden drop in oil prices can make your positive earnings into negative earnings. All you have to do is look at oil companies in 2020 and 2022. 2020 oil companies were among the least profitable companies in the world. 2022, they're among the most profitable. Cyclical companies, when the economy does well, and of course in 2020, you had a pandemic a macro-driven shock to the system. Or it can be interest rate dynamics. What happens, the interest rate on your debt suddenly jumps. Yeah. We used to think, again, this is something emerging market companies face. It usually doesn't happen in developed markets, and you're right. But 2022 might have been an exception. You could have had a company that felt pretty comfortable at the start of the year in terms of servicing the debt it had outstanding. By the end of the year, circumstances could have changed. The bottom line is default varies over time. And to capture how much default varies, I'm going to look at two graphs. First, I'm going to look at business loan delinquencies over time. Think of this as the first stage towards default. You go delinquent on a loan, you fail to make an interest payment. And this actually looks at the, uh, you know, the percentage of bank loans that are delinquent over time. And you can see in this graph the macro effects. First, in the late 80s, early 90s, you see a recession pushing up delinquencies. Then you get to 2000 and 2001, you see a mar first a market shock, a dot-com bust, followed by 9-11, which kind of slowed things down. And again, you see the jump. Not as big as it was in the 1990s. And then you have a period of low default rates, but perhaps the market was just lulling you into a false sense of complacency because then the 2008 crisis hit. And that was a crisis that created probably one of the biggest increases in default and the longest lasting effect on defaults of pretty much any crisis over the last 50 years. And then the first quarter of 2020, we had a mild shock to the system. It was actually a big, sh we thought it was going to be a much bigger shock, or shock when COVID hit but it be very quickly recovered from that. Now, 2023, we don't know yet. The fact that defaults were low in 2022 might make you feel good, but you know, perhaps that was because the economy stayed solid in 2022. There's a lagged effect that comes from interest rates going up, and perhaps we haven't seen it yet. Now, of course, a, a more decisive measure of default is when companies themselves default. This is from S&P looking at defaults going back to 1981. Again, you see the early 80s, you see the Volcker recession. Late 90s, the, the recession you just talked about, 2001. In fact, notice that the, the graphs here have pretty much the same periods when loan delinquencies, defaults, liquidations. They might not all go you know, be the same numbers, but they are all driven by the same forces. Which brings us to 2023. While defaults did not pick up significantly in 2022, the second half of 2022, you saw started to see the first signs of more defaults. But ratings agencies looking forward are seeing much more, are, are seeing a wall of worry. In fact, it shows up in a couple of places. One is in their estimated default rates for 2023 and 24 are much higher than 2022. It also shows up in ratings downgrades. You started to see the number of downgrades increase during 2022 ahead of potential defaults, and more so in some sectors than others. Which brings us to a final question, which is what's 2023 going to bring in terms of actual defaults? Clearly, ratings agencies are worried, you know, and there's talk of more defaults. But to understand what's going to drive defaults in 2023, I'm going to go back to a device, a structure I've used multiple times already in my data updates. Now, I've described 2023 as a year that's going to be governed by two big forces. One is inflation and what it does during the course of the year, and the other is the economy and whether it goes into a recession. 
and I have constructed four scenarios. Clearly, there are far more than these, but four scenarios to illustrate the possible end outcomes. So I think what happens in terms of default risk and in terms of companies actually getting into trouble and debt will depend on which scenario unfolds. Let's take the worst one, worst scenario first, which is that inflation stays high and you have a steep recession. Then you're going to see earnings drop because of the recession and you're also going to see much higher interest rates because inflation stays high no matter what the Fed thinks. And that's going to be a nightmare scenario for defaults, default risk. Defaults are going to multiply and default rates are going to be high across the board. The best and most benign scenario, of course, is if inflation comes back down quickly. There's no recession, in which case interest rates are going to come down if inflation comes down. Again, Fed or no Fed. Earnings are going to be resilient and you're going to see default rates stay at the low levels you've seen for much of the last decade. But there are two other intermediate scenarios. One is where there's a steep recession and inflation comes down. This, of course, seems to be the Fed game book. I mean, whether it's a steep recession or a recession, they want to slow the economy down and bring inflation down. The good news is interest rates will come down. The bad news is there will be an earnings hit and there will be defaults, but it'll probably be restricted to cyclical firms. And finally, there's a scenario where the economy stays resilient. There's no recession, but earnings and inflation stays high, in which case you're going to get resilient earnings, but high, high interest rates. It, the firms that are going to get into trouble then are the firms that have short term that, that, have, that are borrowed up to the hilt at low rates, but now it refinance at much higher rates. So we'll have to wait to see which of these scenarios unfolds, but it's going to be an interesting year. I hope you found this session useful. Thank you very much for listening, and I'll see you down the road. Take care.